Stay where I can see you. Pull your skirt down, young lady. Pull your pants up. I gave him a bath last night. You do not talk to your mother that way. Do not run in this house. I'm gonna get you. Yeah, honey, I, I see you. Yeah, I see you. I don't know why. Do not ask me why. Because I said so. What do you say? Yes, what? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Please. Can you say thank you? Do you want to go to timeout? Timeout right now. Go to your room. What did I just say to you? What did I just say? You wait till dad gets home. Do not make me tell you again. How do you know you don't like it? You've never even tried it. Did you brush? I'm gonna feel your toothbrush. Don't forget to flush. I don't hear a flush. Who didn't flush? Do not touch anything. Hey babe, is there any more C-A-N-D-Y? What about R-E-D-V-E-L-V-E-T-C-A-K-E? -E -E? Where's your shoe? Why do you only have one shoe? We're leaving, get your shoes. Where are your pants? I can't understand you, can you use your words? I don't know. Go ask your dad. Go ask your mom. You buckled? Why are you not buckled? Do not make me stop this car. I will turn this car around. We will get there when we get there. Quiet! Shh! Oh, the pains of parenting sometimes, huh? If you uh, have been with us, we have been in a series uh, for the last several weeks. We took a break last week from Vacation Bible School uh, on sound bites for parents. Little tidbits of information that Every parent needs to know in order to raise their children in the admonition of the Lord. This week I came across a, a humorous article that I, th I, I thought was, I just couldn't stop laughing when I saw some of these. This is an article about what kids have learned that they've shared with their parents. Really great advice. For example, parents, if you hear the toilet flush and the words, uh-oh, it's already too late. If you use a waterbed as home plate while wearing cleats, it doesn't leak, it explodes. And just for your information, a king size waterbed holds enough water to fill a 2,000 square foot home four inches deep. Here's another bit of advice someone gave uh, a child learned. No matter how much jello you put in the swimming pool, you still cannot walk on water. And pool filters don't like jello. This one I like. Pa parents, kids want you to know that. Cats don't like to be wrapped in duct tape. <laughs> they also want you to know that the spin cycle on the washer, washing machine doesn't make earthworms dizzy, but it does make cats dizzy, and cats can throw up two times their body weight when dizzy. And then my favorite, if you hook a dog leash over a ceiling fan, the motor isn't strong enough to rotate a 42-pound 42 42 boy wearing underoos and a Superman cape. However, it is strong enough to spread paint on all four walls of a 20 by 20 square foot room. It's great. Well, we, we have taken the two weeks, we, have, we, have been, we took a week off, we're going back, and we're going back to Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, and here's what it says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Why don't you say that with me? Put it up on the screen. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's a great, great word here. The word train, we've talked about this. The word train comes from the Hebrew, and it refers to a responsibility of a Hebrew midwife. Whenever a baby was born, she would take two fingers, dip them into this honey and date mixture, and swab it onto the gums of the child to begin the feeding process to create a thirst in the child so he would be, want to, he or she would want to eat. And what I believe that Solomon was saying to us is that parents, our responsibility is to create a sense of thirst in our children for right things, for righteous things, for the things of God. And, the, and, the, and that's juxtaposed really to what goes on in our society because we have been taught that the most important thing to do as a parent is get your kids through the school, give them a good education so they can go be successful in this world. And it sounds great. And obviously all of us would like for our children to have success in this world. But what Jesus said, and when coupled with the passage that we see in Scripture, if we help our children become successful by the standard of the world, but they do not have Christ, then they're not successful at all. We have caused them to fail at the most important decision in life. Jesus said it this way, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but forfeit his life? Just because you have everything this world has to offer, if you do not have Christ, then you've missed it. So in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we find a great passage of Scripture that really helps us to understand our responsibility as parents. 
It starts out and says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Now watch this. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. In other words, in every aspect of your life, at all times, you are to have influence over your children so that they would know, honor, and love God as much, if not more, than you. And so what does that mean? It means the priority for every one of us as parents is that we must have Jesus on the throne of our life. He must be the one who's large and in charge. He's the one that we have got to pursue. His word, his spirit, it's, it's, a, it's a desire to say, God, I'm going to trust you and you only. I'm going to put all my hope in you. I'm not going to turn to my own abilities, my own ingenuity, but I'm going to make, I'm going to acknowledge, I'm going to put you in the right place so that you can direct my steps. That is the call of a parent. We must have Christ as our priority or else our children do not have much of a hope of discovering God's best for them. And so he tells us that we are to make sure we have God in the right place. And then second, we're to diligent, diligently invest the Jesus in us into our children. We're to model it. We're to encourage them. We're to help them to see what it means to walk with God. And so the idea of training up our children in the way of the Lord, I believe we can take this acrostic trains and help us to learn the principles. T-R-A-I-N-S. We have looked at several of them so far. We looked at T for time. And time is about making sure that we give not just quality time, but quantity time. And I shared with you as we looked at that week that quality time, while it's wonderful, is not near as important as quantity time. Because it's in the quantity moments of life that our children see us. They see us living life. It's not when we're on our best behavior. It's when we're just doing life. Sometimes they see us at our worst. Sometimes they see us at our best. But they're, they're engaged with us doing life. And that's when most of the teachings are going to be caught. Is when they're hanging out just doing life with us. Then we looked at our responsibility. Living in a day of, 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 of entitlements where everyone seems to, to say someone owes me something or I, I've become a victim because someone did something to me. Teaching our kids to stand on their own two feet. Teaching our kids how to take responsibility for their actions and responsibility for their circumstances is, is absolutely critical. If we do not teach our kids because bad things will happen to them. If they are the victim, they'll, they'll just dissipate. They'll fall the wayside. But if they learn that God can even use the bad things that happen in my life along with the good things that happen in my life, and that God can shape and mold me and use those for his glory and for my good, we teach our children not to become the victims, but become responsible for themselves. Then we looked at acceptance. Acceptance is embracing our, embracing our kids for who they are. Not for what they can do, not for their abilities or inabilities, not for when they're good or when they're bad. It is embracing them because they are our children. It's embracing them for who they are, who God created them to be. And then last or two weeks ago, we looked at the idea of integrity. Teaching our kids to value honesty, truth, character, helping them to, to, to realize that that telling the truth and not stealing and, and, and respecting other people, how valuable that is, respecting themselves. And, and we talked about how integrity really is who you are when no one else is looking. I, I think it's not just who you are when no one else is looking, it's, 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 it's who you are when people are looking. It's being an honorable person, being trustworthy and truthful. Well, today we're going to look at the letter N, and N is for nurture. You know, it's interesting that in psychology today, there is a debate, back to the debate for many years, going back and forth about nurture versus nature. Uh, am I born this way or have I learned this behavior? And you may think, well, that, how important is that? Well, when you begin to unpack that, it's actually very important, especially more so today than maybe ever in, in, in our culture. 
Because if I'm born, it says I'm pre-wired, I'm predisposed to this type of behavior. I, I was made this way. Well, when you start looking at some of the, the convictions and the beliefs, some of the behaviors in our day and time today, if I can say, you know what, I'm, I, I, I choose to be this way, but the Bible calls that sin, what we're doing is we're minimizing sin and righteousness, and we're saying, that's just the way I am. You just have to accept me for my sinful condition. Here's the problem with that. James says, for he that knows who do right but doesn't do it, it is for he who knows to do right but doesn't do it, it is sin. Sin is a choice. And so if I say that my nature, that's just the way I am, then what I'm saying is I don't have a choice in my sinfulness. But that goes against the scriptures. It goes against common sense. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not born with personality traits and abilities. We know that from Psalm 139. It says that we're fearfully, wonderfully made. We're knit together in our mother's womb. We know that we have a nature that, that causes us to look at life and to pursue life. But to, but to go to the extreme of saying that I can justify my sin by saying I'm born that way, that's a problem. So then comes in the aspect of nurture. Nurture is the external forces that come into our lives. The external things, whether it's, whether it's our education, whether it's our experiences, our family, our, whatever's happened in culture, that's helping to shape. And so the question is, which one is it? Is it nature or is it nurture? Do you know what the Bible says? Yes. It's both. You are fearfully, wonderfully made. But there are also individuals, there's also circumstances that help to shape us in who we become. And today, as we're in this series on parenting, I want to talk about what really is maybe the most influential external factor in developing who we are, and that is our parents. Here's what it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1, 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with a promise. See that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Now, I want you to see this phrase, bring them up. That's kind of the key phrase here in this passage. The word in the Greek actually means to nurture to nourish, to care for. I find it interesting because if you were to go back to chapter 5, verse 29, when he's talking about husband and wives, he looks at the husband and he says, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. And he basically says, love your wives and the way you care and love for yourself. And so the word there is the same. It's the, it's, it's the word to nurture. Just as you take care of yourself, just as you cherish yourself, just as you nourish yourself, just as you are so important, care for your wife. But then he says, also, you should care for your children in the same way. And so he gives this picture that we're to nourish and nurture with great tenderness. The way that you want to be treated, that's the way that you are to treat not just your wife, but you're to treat your children. And so the question is, how do we do that? Well, there's two principles I believe come right out of this passage. The first two are, are, are in, in verses 1 and 2. The second one's verse 3 and 4. But he says that, that the first thing that has to happen is there has to be an environment of expectation. If we're going to nurture our children, if we're going to nourish their soul, if we're going to help grow them, we have to create as parents an environment of expectation. Now, expectation is about establishing a godly standard. Notice what it says. Obey your parents in what? In the Lord. And so, the, the standard we're set, we're not setting a standard of this world, parents. We're to set a standard of God's expectations. And that standard is that they love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that, that, that they walk with Him, that they know Him, that they seek His will. So, we have to set a standard that is in the Lord. But as we set this standard, we also need to help our children meet this standard. And the way we do that is, one, is we have to have an expectation of obedience. We need to expect our children to do what they're told to do when those things that we tell them to do are in accordance with the Word of God and the will of God. 
And as parents, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to lead our children to, the, to know and to serve and honor God. The word obey here in the Greek is the Greek word hupo akuo. The word we get acoustic is, is, is akuo, and then hupo means under. So it means a child is to hear under. So uh, students, as long as you live under, the, un, un, under your parents' roof, when your parents come to you and say, hey, I'd like for you to go clean your room, you know what the answer is supposed to be? Parents, tell them what the answer is supposed to be. Yeah. How many of you think it's wait until I'm done with what I'm doing? How about tomorrow? You know, the thing that I, I, I fall into the trap of, I'll say, hey, go do this, and they won't do it, and, and I'll go, one, two, and I, let me tell you the problem with that. While you think you're being patient, what we're doing is teaching our children that it's okay to be disobedient. It's okay to procrastinate. And let me tell you the problem with that. What do you think is going to happen if our children do not learn to be responsive to authority when they're given instruction? So let's say your, 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 your child goes into the world and they didn't learn obedience in our home. They didn't learn how to respect authority in the home. So what happens when they go into the workplace and they're disrespectful to their boss? What's going to happen? They're going to go back home without a paycheck. They're going to get fired. What happens if they're at school and they're disrespectful to the principals or to the teachers? Here's my point. One of the great priorities we have is to teach our children to be responsive immediately. The, the way that it reads in the Greek is happy obedience. Not resentful obedience. We need to teach them the value of responding to us. And the way we do that is we give them instruction, we give them guidance, and we model it. I love this quote. It says, children learn obedience under the guiding and loving hand of their parents. As parents model obedience to God and to God's Word, it influences their children to obey God and to obey them. And if that's not enough, then parents can apply the proper discipline to help lead their children. The result is influencing your children to obey you as their parents as they would respond to God. Now this is a great statement. In fact, when children obey their parents, they are obeying God. What a great truth. Now, what's the objective? You know, we want to teach children obedience. And, and the truth is, children can learn obedience through, through, well, there's three kind of levels of obedience. First is, I'm going to obey because there are going to be consequences. And some will go, oh, that sounds so horrible. You know, if you don't do this, you're going to get a spanking. You're going to get a timeout. You're going to get this or this or this. And you may, may think that that's bad, but let me pose it to you a different way. Would you rather your children be obedient because of fear of getting a spanking or fear of getting disciplined, or would you rather them be disobedient and face the consequences of their disobedience? That make sense? It's far better. God is not opposed to us sometimes going, you know what, I'm not going to sin because it could destroy my marriage. I'm not going to have that affair because it could destroy my marriage. That's okay. Now, is that the reason not to have it? No, we want you to not have an affair because you love your spouse with all your heart. But if the reason you're not going to have an affair is because you could lose your marriage or you could lose your integrity or you could lose your job, whatever it is, it's okay to be obedient because you do not want to face the consequences of disobedience. Folks, it's okay if our children obey us because they don't, really spank, they don't want to get a spanking or they don't want to go to time out. It's okay. Now, we want to move them up to the next level. And the next level is it's that, that children will be obedient or will sometimes will be obedient because there's a reward. You know, we'll say, hey, if you, if, if, like the other day I asked Madeline, I said, Madeline, if you vacuum my car, clean my car, I'll pay you 10 bucks. Okay. Now, would it have been better if I had come home and my car was already clean? I looked at Madeline and I said, who cleaned my car? And Madeline goes, I did. Why'd you do it? Because I love you, Dad. That's like, woo! I mean, that'd be awesome. But you know what? There are sometimes they do something and there's a reward for it. If that does not happen in our lives, 
You know, if you go to Proverbs chapter 3, it talks about giving and being faithful, giving God your first and best, not your least and leftovers, giving a tithe, bringing it. And God says, if you do that, see if I want to open up the floodgates of heaven and bless you. It's okay to be obedient because there's a reward. There's a blessing. That's okay. It's okay for your children to know that. I, I, I'm here with the other day, I was with Camden, and Camden did something that I asked him to do. And I was like, man, that's so awesome. I'm so excited. I'm so pumped. And then a few minutes later, he came back and goes, hey, I did it, Dad. And I go, that's like, thank you, son. He goes, can we go get a milkshake now? <laughs> that's okay. But the ultimate level of obedience is when we do it because we love. You see, that's why God wants us to be obedient to him because we love him. As parents, as representatives of God to our children, we want to teach them that to be obedient to us and to be obedient is to be obedient to God. And they do it because of love. But that takes time. And that's part of the process of raising our children, teaching them to be obedient. The second thing we're going to do if we're going to create an expectation uh, a standard of expectation is expectation of respect. Look what it says. Honor your father and mother. Obedience is a requirement for any child that's in the home under, or still on the payroll. But when they move out, honoring is something that they needed to learn in the home. The word honor here means to esteem, to value highly, to hold in high regard. It's to treat as precious. I like the way one commentator said it. He says, it means to uphold one's worth and influence by doing the things that cause them to be respected, cause your parents to be respected in the eyes of others. It means to love and care for them throughout their lives, never neglecting them or acting like you've never been their child. We have a church member that I know that was raised in a, in a home in which he, he struggled with his relationship with his parents. He, he sometimes didn't feel loved. He sometimes felt like his parents were disinterested. He always felt like he was trying to win their approval. And yet now he has a parent who's in a nursing home. And I got to tell you, I've been blown away by the way he cares for his mom. He goes and sees her every day. He, take, he pays the bills for her to be in this nursing home. He takes care of her, goes and sees her. And what he's showing, what he's exemplifying is what it means to honor your father and your mother. See, it doesn't matter how good or bad your mom or dads are. You still have responsibility to honor them, to show them respect. In fact, I would go so far to say that as, as believers, if when we honor and, and, and respect our parents, God can use that to influence our parents to Christ. The second thing that we see in this text is on in verse 3 and 4. So not only is there, is, not only is there an environment of expectation, there's an environment of encouragement. If you look at it, it says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. The word encourage, it means to inspire, to motivate, to embolden, to, to give courage to. And we're trying to move our children to action. And so he says, there's one thing you don't do, and there's two things you do. The one thing you don't do is exasperate your children. The word exasperate means to provoke. It means to bait. It means to, to drive a wedge between. The idea is that you don't lord over your children. Remember, you're to, you're to tenderly care for them as you care for yourself. And so as parents, we have this tremendous opportunity to, to lead and influence our children. Now, with that said, it doesn't mean that you don't take hard stands. It doesn't mean that you don't have boundaries. In fact, we want to find out it's just the opposite. It just means you don't do things to try to drive a wedge between you and your children, but rather you're trying to draw them to you. It's, this is an amazing teaching when you consider the context. Paul was writing to the Ephesian church. The Ephesians were a Roman, they, they were under the influence of Rome. Therefore, they were under Roman law. And there was a Roman law when it comes to parenting, in particular to dads, that honestly, when I share it with you, you guys are going to be I can't believe it was like that. And so what he is offering to them is absolutely contrary to the culture. It was called patri potestas. 
And what Patri protestis, Patri is father, protestis is rule or, or standard. And so he, he was given, the dads were given complete authority over their homes. When I mean complete authority over their homes, I'm talking he had the ability, if he didn't like what his kids did, he could say, you know what, I'm tired of the way you're acting, I'm selling you into slavery. He could say, you know what, I don't like what you just did, kill the kid. And it was legal. It was legal. And I know some of you are going, really? It was legal? It was said that in the days of Rome that when a baby was born, they would take the baby to the dad and the dad would look at the child and if he wanted the child, he'd give it a thumbs up and the child would live. If he didn't want it, they would give it a thumbs down and the child would die. Executed right there. Now, before you go, how barbaric. We don't have patri potestis now. We have matri potestis now. Because now, before a child, when a child's in the womb, the mother has been given the right to extinguish life if she doesn't want it. We're just as barbaric. In fact, I was reading an article that talked about the, the, the main reason that there's so many kids in foster care. It's not because of a loss of a parent. It's not because of, of you know, something bad's happened in someone's life. The number one reason for foster care in America is because of parental disinterest. I don't want these children, they're gonna cramp my style, they're gonna, they're gonna cause me to have the life I did not want. And so when we look at this, we've gotta say, okay, so what does it really mean to create an environment of encouragement? Well, first it means you don't lord over your children, you teach and you guide your children. The word here actually gives the impression that the parent's call is to disciple their children. It is to raise them to know God, but it's also to raise them to, to know morality, to know ethics, to, to learn skills, that we help guide our children along. And so he gives two words. He gives the word training, it might be discipline in your, in your Bible, and instruction. The first is to give a sense of mind by providing the necessary boundaries. That as a parent, we are to give boundaries. We're to say, okay, here's where you can go, here's what you can't, here's what you can do, here's what you can't do. And then secondly is the instruction, we're to give the explanation why. And so we are to invest truth as we give parameters to our children. Now let me see if I can give you an example. Let's say that, that little Johnny is, is learning how not to cross the street. And so I take him up and I say, Johnny, here's the street, do not cross over. Here is the boundary. You know what little Johnny's going to do? Little Johnny's going to get up to the edge and he's going to sneak around and he's going to go get his leg out there. He's going to stick his head out. He's going to do everything but cross over until finally he's going to say, nobody's looking. I, I think I'm going to cross it and see what happens. And then he gets hit by a car. What he's saying here in this text is don't just come up and say, don't cross, don't cross over the curb. He's saying, bring little Johnny up Say, Johnny, don't cross over the curb. And here's the reason why. Because there are cars zipping up and down the street. And if you step into the street, if you cross over this, this, this boundary, it could hurt you. You could die. And so you give explanation why. Now, what do you think is going to happen with little Johnny? Little Johnny's going to come up and he's going to come over. He's going to look. And when he doesn't think you're looking, he's still going to step into the street. And that's when you have the pleasure of becoming a parent. <laughs> because what are you going to do? Are you going to sit back and go, hey, watch this? <laughs> no. What you're going to do is you're going to go get little Johnny, you're going to take him out of the street, and then you're going to help him learn physically what it means not to go into the street. Amen? Can I get a witness? <laughs> why do you do that because one you love your children two is because you understand that it's your responsibility if you don't teach him if you do not set the parameter and you do not teach him why not to do that you will feel responsible and culpable and you would be 
When he talks about discipling, training your children, he's saying, parents, you've got to get involved. You've got to set those boundaries, and you have to hold those boundaries because the boundaries are for that child's good. But then you also get them to give expl explanation and teach and encourage. And when they do step over, because they will, that's when you step in and say, okay, let's learn from this. And you help your child. The nuance here is that as parents, we are disciples, disciple makers. And we're going to invest Christ, we're going to invest truth, we're going to invest reality into the lives of our children so that they know God and they can be functional in this world. And that requires tender nurture. I'm going to remind you of what I was reminded of this week. Sometimes I forget that my children are not adults. Sometimes I forget that my children are experiencing things for the first time and I've taken, I've, 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 inv I've experienced it so many times I just take it for granted. Where are they going to learn it? How are they going to learn it? And how am I going to and give them that instruction? Is it going to be with tender compassion? Is it going to be with, with, a, with a gentle firmness? I was reading an article, I don't have it with me right now, but I was reading an article about uh, Ann Landers made the comment, it was something to the effect of, if you want to, it, 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 you have a choice when it comes to parenting your children. When they do something wrong, you can explode, you can throw temper tantrum, you can yell, cuss, curse, do whatever you want to do. And if they turn out all right, it won't be because of you. It'll be a miracle. Or you can realize as a parent that you're guiding someone who's farther behind, who's not gone through the things you've gone through, who's not learned the things that you've learned, and you can begin to coach them and teach them and love them in gentleness so that they begin to comprehend and apprehend the necessary skills they need in order to thrive with God in this life. Amen. That's what it means to nurture. So with that in mind, I want to go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I want you to listen very clear, clearly and carefully. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You know what that tells me? It tells me if you're going to nurture and nourish your children, you've got to be more strong-willed than they are. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You know what that tells me? It tells me that your children may look at you and go, Mom, Dad, you are a broken record. And you look at them and say, and when you get it, we'll move on to the next lesson. But I'm going to be a broken record because it's truth. And because it's the way, that it is truth that's going to lead you to know God, honor God, and serve God with your life. Let's close in prayer. Father, thanks for the chance to study your word this morning. We love you and we're so grateful that you speak into the everyday elements of our lives, such as parenting. Lord, I pray that you would help us today as parents to realize that we cannot parent apart from you, that we need your guidance. We need your truth. We need the Holy Spirit because there are those times that we're short on patience. There are those times that we don't know what to do. But Father, you do. So Lord, I pray that today that each one of us who are parents, that Lord, that we will recommit ourselves to loving you, to having you first. Father, if there's one person here as a parent who's, who doesn't know you, Lord, I pray that today you would convict them and help them to understand that until they get you at the center of their lives, they're just gonna muddle through. But when they have your spirit to guide them, and they have your word to give them parameters and instruction, that Lord, they can become far more effective 
in leading their children to know, honor, and serve you. Father, would you bless our time of invitation? Would you be glorified in it in Jesus' name? Amen. Why don't you stand with me? We're going to close out our time together this morning. and I want to make the invitation very simple. If you don't know Christ your Savior, and you'd like to talk to someone about what it means to know Him, there'll be men out down the front, women down the front, will be more than happy to, to talk with you about your relationship with God. But today I really believe that maybe one of the most important things we can do is to come and to pray for our, our families, to pray for our responsibility to nurture. Maybe we've blown it. We need to come and say, God, I blew it. But I want to begin today, and I want to lay it on the altar. You can sit where you are in your seats. You can do that. You can kneel. But I want to invite you to come to the altar this morning to pray for your families and to pray for your responsibility as parents to nurture your children. Once you respond as God.